Hi everyone, before I start, full disclosure, uh, we are investors in Kabir's uh, QSR chain, which is Burger Singh, but I'm not going to be partial to Kabir, so Zoravar and Riaz, uh, don't worry that. Uh, so really the question is that what's the format that really works in India in terms of scale? Uh, QSR is the, really the traditional model that's worked uh, in most parts of the world. I'm going to take it to Zoravar and Riaz first, who've got multiple formats uh, happening in their businesses. Uh, what do you guys think? What does India need? More QSRs to scale or are there other formats? You know, this is always a tricky uh, time of the day. People are looking for lunch and then here we're trying to stop them from that. <laughs> so uh, bear with us, we'll try and make it interesting. Um, I think India has great depth. India also has... Uh, an incredible, you know, clientele that has become very, very sophisticated. I think they like eating out a lot. We're still at a very nascent stage in terms of eating out. If you look at Southeast Asia, we're not even close to that. Or uh, even in the urban areas, eating out two to three times a month, whereas in certain developed parts of the world, especially in places like Singapore and Hong Kong, they eat out two to three times a day, even breakfast is out. So the demand there's a, lot to, there's a lot to be achieved and the population is obviously on our side and the way the millennials think, which is the primary, you know, you know data, the customer base that all of us are catering for, is great at spending out, you know. They love to eat out every day. They love great experiences. Eat out or order in? Eat out and order in, okay. Now, let's, that's the big disruption thing we're going to talk about a little later, the delivery aspect. But, you know, there's a big, big market and uh, they don't want to buy a car necessarily. They're okay to Uber it. They don't want to buy a house, they're okay to rent it, but they definitely want a great experience. So the, there's a lot of depth already, and that depth is only going to get deeper. From a growth perspective, I think QSR has had a great run in the past two years. You've seen some stupendous year-on-year -year growths. You've seen some, the entire market itself grow considerably. Uh, up till two years ago, the fine casual, casual, and, and fine dine segments, so to speak, were going at a good click. I think up to about two years ago, there was no major disruption in the industry. There was great, you know, the fine casual brand, especially the fine casual side of things was growing very, very quickly. Um, but in the past two years, I've seen some kind of a downward pressure on, um, on this particular side of the business. So the QSR has grown. The fine casual has grown, but at a slightly lesser angle. The angle is not as obtuse as the, as the uh, QSR one. And the main disruptor I find is delivery. I mean, I, found, I was sitting with one of the top guys at one of these um, um, delivery companies, and I found that there are 47 lakh orders a day on these aggregator platforms. I was talking to Kabir a little while ago. 80% of his business comes from online delivery. So naturally, experiential restaurants like some of the ones we have uh, will have some kind of a disruption in that field. And we have noticed that. But the good thing is that we don't have to fight against it. You know, the casual, fine casual and fine dine can still go along with the aggregators and you know, work with them and make delivery an intrinsic business model or a business vertical within their, within their existing restaurants. And it's also a very good way to sweat the asset. Think about it. You have uh, uh, you know, a Chinese restaurant, right? You can always start delivering Chinese food. You know, why do you have to only depend on the walk-ins? You can start delivering, you can make multiple brands from within that store and sweat that asset, uh, especially at lean times. The, un the unfortunate problem is that orders still come only at peak meal times where the restaurant is busy. So that's, you kind of have to manage uh, how to make sure that the in-house operations do not uh, get compromised as a result of the delivery. But I think, I think uh, you have to work with it. And the QSR is growing at a good play pace. I find our segment is also growing at a good pace. We just have to work along with these aggregators to ensure that, uh, you know, it's, it's a win-win situation for all. Yes. Um, so I think when it comes to food, right, uh, the purchase decision is based on mood. And we have to, it's not necessarily only a demographic, but also psychographic. Today, I feel like, you know, rough and ready Chinese. And today I feel like eating a good Indian meal, I feel like a good biryani. Today I feel like going, uh, dressing up and going to someplace nice. And today I feel like just hanging out with my buddies over a beer. 
So I think that, you know, it, the, the psychographic keeps shifting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it means that people want more. They want more choice. They want more variety. India is not a homogenous market. It is very varied. Uh, people want different things. Uh, different types of people want different types of things at different times of day. So I think that, you know, there's tremendous opportunity. And I think uh, to say that one opportunity is better than the other would be a disservice. Uh, there is, um, there's, there's so many options available and you can actually cater to all. So I think that it's all about, you know, finding what you're good at doing, uh, finding your uh, capability and finding your audience and then going after it. There's a tremendous uh, business to be had if you just cater to the SCCA market only in metros, for example. There's enough depth and the depth is going to keep growing, right? We, like Zorawar said, there's so much headroom. If you look at the dining out frequency, and now you're looking at ordering in, and I think that there's a common misconception that we think that dining in is cannibalizing dining out. What I think is dining in is doing is, is replacing the kitchen. It's labor arbitrage in a sense, right? You are, uh, it saves you the time and money and effort. Uh, McDonald's made... You're saying the market is getting expanded basically. Yes, the market is getting expanded. The market is just beginning to expand. Right? We are looking at a two trillion economy. We are where China was maybe 15 years ago. There's, there's no reason to believe that we won't be a, a, a 10 trillion uh, economy very, very soon. And when that happens, when your middle class actually becomes what it is supposed to be, right, right now the middle class really yeah, hasn't it's really. Still very narrow. Yes, but it is going to change. And people are going to. It's not like you get comfortable with a shoe brand or a shirt brand that you only want to wear that shirt or a shoe. With food, you are going, even if I give you best-in-class food, I give you best-in-class service, I give you best-in-class value, you will still look for an option. So does it make sense to only capture one of that spend or does it make sense to capture a larger share of that demographic? Jury's out. So Kabir, opening remarks, and I'm going to pick up on some of the stuff that both Zoravar and Riaz have said. So I kind of agree with both of them on the market being expanded by these aggregators drastically. Um, so I think there's a lot of headroom for everybody in there. Um, it can be a casual dining or a fast dining, uh, asset utilization, uh, moving to uh, a casual dining also, having a, maybe a dark kitchen inside it with a different brand and kind of, you know, utilizing the asset. Um, but between uh, a QSR and a casual dining, I, I see the casual dining space being slightly limited by two, three uh, broad things. Um, one is the fixed cost for a casual dining is slightly higher uh, in the sense the, the number of uh, employees that are required because it's more of a Very high it, touch model. It's a ex ex experience. A guy goes out, he, he, he wants to sit down, he wants to be served. Uh, the chefs are expensive. Um, the second aspect is uh, the food in itself. Uh, the number of SKUs that you have uh, a fairly large uh, so it's on a the wide casual menu. dining. It's a wide menu, and uh, you need specialized guys to kind of prep that. Unlike in a QSR, where the you know the skill levels required are a lot lesser, um, the shelf life of the product is a lot lesser. It needs to be you know prepped in the morning, uh, and therefore the skill sets uh, around it are, are different. Um, the casual dining space uh, is limited in my mind uh, to metros and, and you know, uh, uh, slightly. Even within metros, maybe some parts of those metros, assuming. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I read a, a stat somewhere that about 78% uh, of the casual dining uh, numbers come from uh, metros. Uh, and 22 odd percent from tier one cities. Um, so that kind of limits where you can go to with the product. Um, also, uh, a lot of casual dining is uh, weekend and dinner heavy, so there's, there's not much that is happening on the lunchtime where you're still paying the salaries and, uh, and all of that stuff that goes in it. Um, yeah, so, so I'm a QSR guy, so you know, and I have to defend that uh, model a little more. So, um, I think to just go back to both what, what everyone has said, scalability for other formats. I mean, QSR is tried and tested globally. Uh, in India, we are beginning to see some legs to it. And, you know, homegrown brands are beginning, uh, like Burger Singh, Wow Momo. Wow Momo has been a big success in scaling up. So, uh, to both Zoravar and Riaz, I mean,
in other formats scale is really the issue so does technology in the kitchen is that going to solve the problem uh, even for qsr is technology in the kitchen apart from having a tech spine where you use data is that the problem solvers uh, to bring your cogs down to really you know uh, i mean the back end gets much more efficient um of course i think um, you know everything is going to be tech enabled i think uh, generally people and and especially now the millennials who are digital natives i mean they come up with solutions before their problems uh so yeah i mean tech is going to be a great enabler but at the end of the day there are going to be some basic things that you need to focus on such as good food uh good service good storytelling which is you know a people business and at the end of the day i think people come to restaurants to commune uh you know with the city with the area they are in they want to uh also, my point was that the front end remains uh, you know high touch but at the back end in your kitchen of course you're going to have tech which will enable it will yeah. give yeah. you better analytics uh you know it'll possibly automate your ordering processes it'll keep your stocks uh there'll be, there'll be a lot of automation so there will be some amount of labor saving for sure um you know i think the tech side of things is going to be crucial going forward to scale up mainly for two things and these are the two most important things for our business in any case one is to save costs thereby increasing profitability and second is to somehow get more customers in by increasing sales right so these are two most important things for the restaurant business and how tech is going to help you is firstly by to save costs you can use a plethora of of great platforms available we use quite a few of them that help you live real time manage inventory uh, shift inventory from across various restaurants robots in the kitchen no, that's a little uh, this, we're not talking star wars here right now but yes uh, you know this is you know i think robots is something that's going to be somewhere down the line i don't know uh, but right now the current tech that's available can really really help you in giving you data that obviously controls your costs right you can have uh, real time analysis so of that kind of stuff analytics for But your also, inventory as well absolutely so inventory low, management system low wastage yeah zero wastage we're not uh, we've not done an erp as yet because i think our systems are not yet ready but we are about to do that as well but even the inventory management software that we use currently helps us daily track costs so in that sense we've been able to control them very effectively we're able to make sure that we study patterns of sales and thereby send food to the various restaurants from the central storage all our restaurants cook food live but the raw material is sent centrally so you can control that wastage is reduced pilferage is reduced food cost the big word that we all talk about input cost comes down but i think another facet of tech that can really help businesses nowadays is data analysis you know we talk about how the value of google and all these big big companies based on being big data banks right so i think we are obsessed with capturing data from our customers we feed thousands of people a day across our restaurants as, as all of us do and that's a great treasure a treasure lying there to be harnessed and how that helps you is by analyzing consumer patterns by making sure just by storing the information it gives you the opportunity to constantly reach out to them i mean imagine if i if you get a message from a restaurant congratulate i mean you know happy anniversary why don't you come by a dessert is on us you will be tempted to go to that restaurant as opposed to anybody else so it's that kind of data tracking not just of their birthday and anniversary information becomes less high touch but yet the customer gets that personal sort of interface. absolutely they get that personalized touch which is what experiential restaurants are all about you know that you you got to feel pampered you got to feel special you got to feel loved and i think data helps you do that so from that perspective tech can help you with the two most important things saving costs and increasing sales kabir how do you see tech helping scale up QSR so for us tech is a big one simply because uh, a lot of our orders are generated online um so uh, there are two aspects uh, to it one is cost saving and the second is analytics and the third is just basic functioning of the uh, of the restaurant um on the on the inventory side it's important kind of helps you save costs uh, pilferage uh, wastage levels and also be able to kind of gauge uh, what seasons are coming around the corner uh, for us that is exceptionally important because the margins in the qsr segment are are lower than uh, than than the 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 numbers these guys are playing with uh, the second aspect is the the sales uh, end of it um, with these aggregators contributing a very large part of the of the 
um, you know, sales pipeline, um, it becomes a hassle where the consumer, uh, the dine-in consumer is standing in front of you, he's also ordering, and you've got, you know, orders coming in from, uh, from the aggregators that need to be double punched. Uh, so uh, a lot of our efforts over the last six months have gone into kind of ensuring that uh, that process is automated. There's still some issues with it because all aggregators don't want to give their APIs out, uh, but, but we're still getting there. Uh, the third aspect of it, uh, and, and they pointed out very correctly, is the consumer behavior. Uh, once you've captured the data, you, you kind of put them into buckets on who's a high spender, who's a low spender, and then kind of target your marketing efforts uh, based on those analytics. Uh, today's world, again, for, for us, the promo costs have gone really high uh, simply because the competition in the delivery market has gone up, the barriers to entry is low because, again, the aggregators play a massive role. Uh, for us to be able to compartmentalize what consumer behavior or patterns one guy is following as compared to the other guy in which one you want to retain and how you want to play with that system um, is, is a massive part. Uh, so I would imagine that after my uh, marketing team, my biggest team in my office is my tech team. Yep. Um, so Zoravar, you mentioned aggregators and you know, how they are the big disruptors. I mean, they've of course disrupted the whole QSR space. How does your uh, segments re you know, reacting to aggregators? And do you think there's going to be a big shift? I know there was some conversation about how the market and the pie is expanded, but has it expanded enough to really, you know, keep the discounters at bay? And, and are customers still willing to pay full price for experience? At some point in time, VC money runs out. <laughs> Don't say that. Let's see. At some point in time, you, can't, you, know, you, you cannot uh, purchase orders. You have to deliver orders. And uh, what's happening nowadays a lot is there's just crazy discounting going on. Restaurants are paying the price. Um, their bid to capture the client is, is important for their business model. And I have nothing against it. Listen, like I said, my phase, my personal phase and my journey with, uh, with aggregators has been complete you know, obliviousness to them, to denial that they're having an impact, to now complete acceptance that they are an important facet of our business. And we have to work with them. I mean, I cannot be on this high horse thinking, I don't, I'm a fine but, uh, dining. To what point? I mean, fine dining? I mean, how does that? No, no, no. I see. Like, fine so dining, stay a masala word. library will never deliver. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, we don't even let people do takeaway. I mean, we don't promote it. We let them give it, but we don't promote it. Right. But, you know, why should a papaya or a farzi cafe or a bow tie or so a tiger we, not deliver food? I think there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, we, we always thought that our food is best consumed and experienced within the four walls of our restaurant. But, a lot of the times, convenience plays a huge role, and all humans are at the base, hu convenience junkies. We love convenience, and the traffic of the metros of this city don't help, right? You don't, sometimes you're tired, you come back at 8.30, 9 o'clock, you want to go to your favorite restaurant, but you're not able to because you don't want to find parking, or you're going to get into another traffic snarl, all that kind of stuff. But now comes Swiggy and Zamaro, and all your best restaurants that were initially not delivering are now available at your home. Now, that's complimentary business, right? A customer that was not going to come to you. But you won't discount. Will you discount? But, no, we don't discount. Well, we not started delivery. Only, we only deliver from one restaurant yet. So we don't discount at all. But we don't think that that's a good way to do the business in any case. I think the right way to do business is produce a food uh, product that is so addictive that people want to order it again and again. And I think beyond a point, even these aggregators will stop discounting heavily. That'll help the business go even further. But just look at our size. We're talking about 47 lakh orders a day. Um, you know, China does five times that. Five times that. 47 lakh. Think about that number. That's a huge number. Yeah. China does five times that. 4.7 million orders a day. That is twice the local population of yeah. Dubai. You look at Luka and all, I mean, the way that's grown is just unbelievable. Who has? The coffee chain in China, the way it's grown yeah. is just unbelievable. I mean, it's... You know, you just can't even imagine that I mean, kind just of coffee and it's not yeah. been the pr predominantly like India been a tea drinking nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's had a huge impact. I think delivery is something you have to embrace. What percentage of our, I don't think we'll ever have 80% of our business through delivery. Um, and we don't want that to be either. But if it adds 15, 20% uptick, then that's good. Yes, you, your brands are at different price points. You've done very well, actually, with social and the price points that you managed to deliver to the customer. How do you see the aggregators? Uh, what's your relationship? And <clears throat> so I agree with Zorawar. I think uh, they are, uh, aggregators are developing a completely new vertical for 
food service providers and uh, uh, you know the, like you have Netflix and Amazon which is also one of the biggest uh, threats to dining out uh, because you <laughs> yeah. know yeah it is I mean yeah, it is yeah it yeah. is but it is yeah. also growing like I said it is creating another revenue stream I think that while there might have been a 20% cannibalization between dining out and ordering in but but the rest of the business that the aggregators have built is actually exponential business which is replacing the kitchen so um, I, I personally think that you know you have dining out business has to be viewed as a dining out business uh, you cannot mix it with casual dining or QSRs of course QSRs deliver but the metrics of your delivery business are very different yeah. your, your cost prices are very different your cost structures are very different right, yeah. and you the big challenge is that having uh, a delivery price and having a restaurant price will always create conflict. But you'll so, also have to create products which deliver well. I mean, there's also that challenge. Yeah, so I think that if you are in a restaurant business, I think that, you know, 10 to 15 percent, you will have incremental sale coming from delivery. But the, the, the majority of it will be dine-in customers. Right? But if you want to create a very serious delivery-only business, the numbers are completely different. And what I would recommend is you to approach it completely different. You could either sweat the asset, but then you're going to have trouble. You're going to have to choose between servicing the customer that's Who's inside in? your four walls, yeah. or you're going to have, you're making sure that your order is delivered within 30 minutes or less, because that's the important metric when it comes yeah, to yeah. delivery. And your product has to travel well, basically. Your pro not, not your entire menu doesn't travel well. Right. There will be products on your menu, and you can, you can restrict the, men you know, the menu which is available online for ordering. And you right. can you can yeah. focus on food, but largely I think that delivery business is a different uh, business because your cost structures are different, and therefore your pricing, your marketing, everything should be different. You could you could like USRs, it makes sense, but for for casual dining restaurants, it doesn't. And we are on a social and smokehouse deli, tasting room, uh, saltwater cafe, uh, Prithvi cafe are all cafes, right? People are coming for a sense of community. For, for people. Why, why do people come for cafe? They're not coming to a cafe because they're hungry. They're coming because they want to talk to somebody. They want to hang out with somebody. They want to have a social moment with somebody. So they're coming for that purpose and then what we build around that is different. So I think it's, you know, you can't have a one size fits all rule. I think all these businesses require a slightly different approach, a slightly different, uh, you know, support infrastructure. And, and you, you choose where, what the market you want to go after. How do you feel about the aggregators? Um, and yeah. are they going to redefine QSR completely? I think they already are. Um, I think the aggregators are here to stay. Uh, they are uh, increasing the size of the market. Uh, but these crazy times of heavy discounting, like you said, the VC money is eventually going to uh, end and the business will have to get rationalized where these guys eventually want to make money. Um, but till the time this crazy time is on, um, I think the, there'd be some wisdom in riding the wave. Um, the aggregators for, for somebody like us who was always wanted, we wanted to be the, the dominoes of burgers, um, but it required a lot more effort in building that infrastructure as far as the riders and uh, having the right tech to be able to deliver in 30 minutes was concerned. Um, I think these guys have kind of started build, building the infrastructure for us. Um, so they're good sides, they're bad sides. They take 20 odd percent in commission. Um, but uh, they save me on my rider strength. I'll give you an example. Till November of last year, we had about uh, 80 odd riders on our payrolls. Today, we've got 23. Um, so, so we've kind of saved money over there. Um, post this crazy time, which I think would last about a year or so, there'd still be a lot of viable businesses out there that'd be delivery focused. Um, and 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 the numbers are are you know doing Swiggy said that they were doing one million orders a day uh, a few days back. That's that's a you know even if you can get about ten percent of that entire pie, you you you're set. Um. So coming from you know how the pie has grown and we're looking at you know the middle class growing and so therefore more customers coming in in all formats. Um. How do you think that investors are seeing it? Um, we of course like QSRs, but your investors, other investors, I mean, and has that also disrupted this space? Um, I think uh, there has, there have been quite a few dead bodies. Uh, <laughs> and, and will there be some more? 
having of course right, like any other business right i think um they they have been learnings i think the indian consumers just beginning to show himself it's just beginning to express uh, their own individuality which which is clearly showing that india is a market without precedent right it it is something which is completely unique to what it is and uh, you can't really kind of import uh, paradigms and ideas you have to focus and build a business for india and um, being indian is a great leg up because you really understand the nuance of doing business you know food preferences change people are people looking for uh, you know uh, are they looking for consistency are they looking to have the same product in the north as they are in south of course not they want a completely different product and it depends on how you want to you know tailor it so i but the thing is that when investors first came in the indian consumer hadn't fully re revealed themselves we were still not sure about what the indian consumer wanted uh of course there have been learnings you know things people have there has been a lot of value erosion but i think that now the players who are left in the fray have, have a very de a good understanding of what it takes to be successful in india and i think that you will start seeing you know uh, uh, large uh, food service behemoths emerge if you are looking at a 4 lakh 80000 crore business it stands to reason that the top 10 food services companies in that should be a 10000 15000 crore company and there's no reason why of course right now there are glass ceilings you know there there's a 500 crore glass ceiling there's a 1000 crore glass ceiling there's a 100 crore glass ceiling so these are but i think that they are they are ready to be broken now and i think that the good times are ahead of us are you looking to break it yourself absolutely why not i looked around you know say somebody buy me out and since nobody's going to do it i'm going to do it myself <laughs> You know, I think in the India story is just incredible, right? I, 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 I was seeing a video on the World Economic Forum uh, the other day. <clears throat> I'm a closet economics uh, lover, and uh, I subscribed to that channel, and I found an interesting video on India that just completely blew my mind. We all know that India is the largest, ma growing, fastest growing major economy in the world, grew at 7.8%, great feat by you know, the Indian entrepreneurial ability. But it also spoke about a factor that the top 10 fastest growing cities out of the top 20 are all in India. At a combined average of these top 10 cities, they're growing at 9 to 10% every year. It's uh, the first one, one of the, one, the biggest, fastest one is Surat, yeah. a diamond trading hub. It's growing at 9%, purely vegetarian city. We're about to open a Farsi cafe over there in some time, and it's going to be the world's first all vegetarian Farsi cafe. Oh. And obviously, it's going to be dry. It's going to have no liquor. And it just blew my mind that there was another stat that that video shared, which is going to be incredible for all of us Indians in the room, is that by 2030, all of the top major metros in the world will be Asian cities. And out of those Asian cities, you can safely assume over 50% will be from India. So you're looking at a size of market that obviously all the investors in this room are going to find extremely exciting. It's just there are slightly turbulent weathers at the moment. Already, we're seeing big signs of recovery. The GST input tax removal is a big, big problem for the industry. Uh, we talk about it almost on a daily basis. It is the single biggest thing affecting the industry today is the removal of input tax credit. But I'm sure the government will, you know, listen to our pleas and our humble submissions and will take steps to rectify that. But I think all the investors here are very clear. They have good visions. They are long-term players. They share... Uh, they have data that clearly proves where this thing is headed. And this thing is headed for off-the-chart numbers. You're talking about literally this country has the capacity to consume a lot. It's just about enabling them, giving them the aspects. Tier 2 and Tier 3 is completely uncharted. Just imagine if we unlock that value, just the Tier 2 and Tier 3. This 47 lakh orders will become 20 lakh orders more. And you're talking about, you, you'll reach uh, China numbers. It's very, very highly possible. So I think it's about unlocking the value that, that exists within this great, great nation and uh, the consumer base. Kabir, how do you see investors? I'm I've watching. got great investors. I'm firstly. watching. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel this is a good time to be an uh, uh, investor, especially looking at the consumer setup and, and the restaurant space. Uh, people have uh, started to eat out a lot. Um, in China, I think there are three, uh, 30 eating out opportunities in a month. Um, 
India is somewhere at six or something like that today. Um, it's growing fairly rapidly. Um, uh, I, I think the scale of, of the restaurant would also matter. Uh, India is, is as diverse as Europe and, and should be looked at um, in that manner as, as various territories and you have to kind of uh, um, engineer your menu to kind of suit the, the territory that you're uh, going to go into. Um, what I feel, and this is my uh, completely my personal feeling, is that the average per ticket spend of 150 to about 250 odd uh, is the sweet spot, which I think uh, if you can scale that model up, uh, a restaurant can kind of hit that sweet spot and keep scaling. Um, I think that will be a good bet for the investor community to kind of go after. So, um, you know, investors, of course, like good numbers. Uh, my question now is on the consumer. The Indian consumer in con uh, is, you know, uh, very, very price conscious and value conscious. What are you getting for your buck? Every single buck that the Indian consumer spends, you know, they want to know what's the value and are they getting enough? So in the restaurant and F&B space, how do you guys see that to be able to service and keep those price points, you know, which is attractive for them to keep coming back? How do you manage your back end and engineer that to make it attractive to the consumer? Because I think that's the biggest volatility in, uh, also in your business, right? Apart from land costs, which are very high in India, but really the customer wants value for money. So, Riaz? No, for sure. I think uh, the Indian customer is all about value, but not all about the price. So, if he's getting value, uh, he will come back and he will spend. Uh, you know, I think there's been, you know, an, an amazing case study of Barbecue Nation, which has really cracked that model really well. It's, um, it's a thousand uh, rupee average uh, ticket size or average per cover. And, uh, you know, they are one of the largest uh, food services companies. I think they are more than 550 crores now, which is, uh, which is pretty good for the QSR segment and for a casual dining segment. So, um, I think that what people want value, but that's not the only thing that they are going to come to you for. It, like I said, there are going to be different types of uh, products. Like, uh, for example, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things that aggregators are complaining about is the average order value being at about 110, 120 rupees. And, and Kabir is right that 150 is a sweet spot. But people are willing to spend more. And I think that that kind of what people are willing to pay and how much share of wallet they're willing to give, uh, you know, meals originating out of home is changing and is evolving rapidly. So I think that there will be a progression, but yes, for now, value is important, but that is not the only uh, factor when it comes to food services. What else uh, are the customers looking for in mm -hmm. your uh, segments? So, you know, customers are looking for, they're looking for variety. They're looking for, I think quantity is a big uh, Indian thing. need. It's a, it's a big thing, right? Uh, they not so much about the quality, but they will say quantity kitna hai. I think that's a, it's a big factor. They like to Large see. Large portions. They like to see their plates loaded up, you know. And we are a carb forward, uh, you know, uh, diet. Uh, so fortunately, you know, piling up lots of rice or lots of rotis is not that big a challenge. But people, people do want, they want to have a belly full. And when, when they finish paying for the meal, they want to go out feeling that they've had, they've, they're satisfied with the quantity of food that they've eaten. So there are certain nuances that uh, India is looking for. But I think that what's happening is gradually that, you know, bit by bit, we are stepping up the ladder. Uh, you know, first we started off with only fine dining uh, outside five stars and UDP restaurants and there was nothing. Then there was a whole lot of fine dining restaurants, but nothing in the casual dining. I think now people have come in, they've used uh, McDonald's, they've, they've, they've tried out the Pizza Expresses, they've lived the lifestyle that, you know, their cousins in America were leading. And now they're kind of embracing their own, uh, you know, need or their own relationship with food. And it's evolving because now there's casual dining, there's so much casual dining people in metros, tier one. Now the people are looking to upgrade and go to uh, fine dining restaurants. And that, that shift will keep happening and that focus will keep increasing. There are many more steps in the ladder now. Yes, yes. There are many more steps in the ladder. And that's, what, that's where the real opportunity is that different companies could take up different pieces of that pie. And all of them do well. Mr. Rawat, your view on the Indian consumer? 
I love the Indian consumer. I mean, they pay all our bills, right? We all so love we, the Indian so we love consumer. The Indian consumers. Not all your bills, or our your all my bills. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your <laughs> bills are being paid overseas. Unlike you, unlike you, I don't have like hidden investments. London, <laughs> Dubai, Riyadh. So no, we love now. the Indian consumer, and I think the Indian consumer is um, very value conscious and very value aware. I think Indians are. genetic mathematics that's why even ganesh ji our, our god is all about math right we pray to him a lot and there is something about math and and people's perception of it. i mean we do i have a restaurant in london which just opened recently and i'm not kidding it took me i'm not being you know not being i'm not making comments on other people it took me 2 weeks to get the dsr right here my cashier who gets 20000 15000 rupees a month never makes a mistake it took me 2 weeks to get the ds the daily sales report come in correctly so i think there's something great about indians ability to do math and about you know being aware of the price that they're willing to pay for something you haven't things. seen an american in a restaurant they do separate checks they calculate The they need a, they need a calculator yeah. for the dividing by five yeah. five people so and then 20% tip which thankfully the indian so, customer doesn't do right yeah. they don't do no the, he does it in his head <laughs> he does it in his head actually he's come pre pre prepared so a lot of the times why people like barbecue nation are so successful in a company that i admire a lot is because if 10 people are going to go they know that my lunch is going to cost me 700 bucks including tax i'm going to spend 7000 predictability 7, is important predictability you know what what are they paying for right and value is very is very subjective and it's very personal i might find a you know a specific painting for example at 1 crore rupees very high value somebody else will think that's ridiculous i might find a 5000 rupee uh, belt or a 5000 rupee meal crazy but for other people people go and spend that uh, for lunch if you go to wasabi i dare you to spend less than 5000 bucks you won't get anything to eat so you know i think you're a great food great food fantastic food one of my favorite restaurants but 5000 yeah. rupee lunch is is a little uh, high for the indian uh, diaspora but just going back and talking to, to masala library that's much cheaper <laughs> 3000 <laughs> so i think the uh, the indian consumer is aware of what they're willing to pay and they have already done the math before they even reach there and as of course you're a millennial in which case the millennial is a totally different animal so we're the indian consumer is also very fickle their needs and their demands change every 2 years in fact we reach that stage where in our restaurants if we don't reinvent the menu every few months we start seeing pressure on sales so people just indians expect indians don't like familiarity indian consumers don't like familiarity this no, is my favorite i'm going to go back again and again year after no they have that it. they have that sense of loyalty a lot kabir is nodding is shaking his head and saying no so they i think the indian consumer like i said is is you know it's uh, he or she is extremely extremely aware of what they want but at the same time they want variety but they also are loyal there is immense loyalty some people will visit that same restaurant again and again because of the way it makes you feel how personable you are with them how well you know their you know the demands if you go and you know your drink is already on the table as soon as they hear your reservation that's a good thing that's a good feeling you feel you feel important so the indian consumer story is incredible uh, the indian consumer is very sophisticated very jaded very well traveled knows what they want in terms of value there are you can you can sell a lot of stuff in india you can sell the very expensive to the very uh, very very cheap uh, in the food space i still think there is some margin in going the luxury side you can't really have too many restaurants that you're paying 4 5000 rupees a head that'll survive for long so i think there's still some headroom there but uh, the real meat the real meat in the in the business is at the middle level casual dining casual. fine casual fine casual casual dining is where at least in our segment the real meat is there and of course qsr by itself is a huge huge animal you i love the consumer at 200 bucks kind of an apc uh, for me my ideal target audience is the guy who travels in the delhi metro um even though the apc is about 200 bucks in my mind the indian consumer is is exceptionally demanding when it comes to food uh because for us food is like a ritual you know it's not just grabbing a sandwich and leaving we have dal roti raita you know salad achar 10 things laid out on a plate at home and 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 that kind of they bring that kind of a mentality to to when they go out and eat um an interesting stat from burger singh is that we've got repeat rates in some areas of about 40 odd percent um within 60 days but if you look at the same guy repeating the dish it is under 7% uh and we've got only 23 burgers on the menu um so it puts a lot of pressure on us uh it's it's it, you know to kind of revise the menu uh, every now and then it's slightly easier for the for the casual dining guys but to do so what makes it easy is that india has so many flavors yeah. that 
well they love experimenting we've got yeah. a mac and cheese burger we never thought that it'll work but it did uh, it's it's kind of started moving up the chain really quickly so they love innovation um but but it becomes a little hard on the on the supply side because our supply chain you know is um is supposed to be you know 23 burgers and that's what you sell but but we've come to a stage where we need to revise the lower 20% performing items every quarter uh, which is which if you look at the qsr segment abroad uh, would not be heard of um the the whopper abroad contributes a significant part of the of the burger king uh, portfolio but if you look at our portfolio there is no burger that sells more than 12% um of the total um sku out there you're saying is because of the indian consumer wanting choice yeah, yeah, all the time they, so so i i i differ a little bit on the on the loyalty bit because we we not seeing that at all um uh, 23 burgers and 7% same product repeat rate is is exceptionally low thank you so much uh to the panel and thank you the, for the audience